thank you, uh, James Gavin, for stepping back into the Jazz Spotlight. It's great to see you again. I want to talk about a couple of giants in jazz, and we're going to get to those ladies in a moment. But first, I want to talk to you about you. So were you always interested in writing? How old were you when you got the, the idea of, hey, maybe I'll be a writer? The seeds of that idea probably entered my head at the age of uh, five. Five. Wow, Imagine five? That. When I was four years old, I learned how to read. And uh, therefore, when I was first galvanized by a recording of a singer, I could understand the words. And that recording had a permanent impact on me. And I'll tell you what it was if you want to hear. I'd love to know. We did not have many recordings in, in our apartment in Yonkers, New York. <clears throat> a handful of miscellaneous things, including a, a grade worn 1950 45 rpm record of patty page singing the tennessee waltz ah. that mammoth hit of 1950 that was number one for something like 15 weeks that and a little portable beach style 45 rpm turntable gizmo were there and I will never forget the sensation of watching, putting putting it on the changer with the little arm to hold it in place and watching that record drop onto the platter and spin around and the little robotic tone arm moved over and dropped with a thump onto that record and it was scratchy as hell. And that hokey little record which, by the way, I learned many years later, has the great Buck Clayton playing that muted trumpet solo. Mm -hmm. That record had a major <clears throat> influence on me. It was a sad song. It is a sad song. It's a song about getting dumped. It's about rejection. And why, at the age of five years old, should that have had such a big impact on me? But it touched my heart so much that my my imagination went spinning and I wanted to know, I remember this so distinctly. I, I thought, who is this woman? Uh, why is this? Why do I feel this way? And I think that was the beginning of everything. Ken. Wow. Great story. And I could hear that song in my head as soon as you said it, because I've played it a few times in my career in radio. Uh, and I could just hear her singing that now as you, as you mention it. Yeah. Great story. So five years old, and then you went to school and you did all that thing. And I know you, uh, you're you an award-winning writer, so congratulations to that. Were your mom and dad supportive of your writing career? They weren't unsupportive. Never once did I hear from my mother or father, why don't you get a real job? They were amused by the fact that I was an oddball kid who was interested in the old songs. And they were happy that I loved to read because I grew up going to the library incessantly. And the library was my portal to the outside world. One thing that I used to love to do there was look in old magazines like Q, The New Yorker, and especially Stereo Review, which had been called Hi-Fi Stereo Review Hi -fi. in the 50s and 60s. And I would spend entire afternoons and evenings there looking at old record reviews and educating myself not only about the great American songbook and jazz, but about opera, which is another love of mine. Mm. I was cramming this stuff into my head. One of the writers that I discovered via those reviews, but he was also a three times a week columnist in the New York Daily News, which we had in our home every day, was Rex Reed. Rex Reed Rex, was yeah. launched more or less at Stereo Review magazine in 1965, and he emerged fully formed. The Rex Reed who is writing today is the Rex Reed who was writing in 1965. It was all there. And there was something about Rex's <clears throat> New York sassiness and his um, funny bitchy edge and his absolute air of confidence in his own taste 
that made an influence on me as well. I And it gave me the idea, it helped give me the idea of writing about music. I was not interested in being a critic, though, because I was interested in the lives of the people who made this music. If I, I, I figured out in my head, for example, when I played an album like one of the big albums of my growing up was an album by Doris Day called Day by Night. Do you know it by any chance? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Day by Night with gorgeous Paul Weston arrangements. And it was nocturnal and mostly sad love songs. Slow. And um, that album to this day, I played it as recently as a week ago. That album moved me so much. And it's not that we associated Doris Day with sadness. We do not. But she had the ability to sing about it. And that made me wonder why. Where did that come from? I, I, it's funny that even at that the tender age of, I guess I was about 14 when I first heard that album, I was thinking about things like that. The reason was that I felt a bond with these people. These disembodied voices on records became like friends to me because I didn't have a lot of friends. And I made friends with these singers via their records. The people we're talking about and the other voices of my extreme youth would have been mostly women. Um, Joe Stafford, Margaret Whiting, Peggy Lee. Um, a bit later, Helen Merrill, Morgana King, Blossom Deary. Um, and all of them had the ability to move me, which I've found to be a quite magical power that is not possessed by all. Absolutely true. Yes, even Anita O'Day, who was, again, not associated with touching the heart and would insistently say, I'm not a ballad singer. Anita's ballad, something's really going on there underneath the cool surface. That interested me a lot. And so by this time, I was doing a bit of writing, and I knew in high school that my term papers got great uh, marks, and a, uh, and my favorite English teacher, Mrs. Rosemary Murray, uh, once wrote uh, at the end of one of my term papers, which got an A, she said she complimented me, and then she added your work. Meaning, did you steal this? Wow. Rather than being offended by that, I thought, wow, that's really something. And okay. she thought I stole this. And from that point on, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Do you remember the first story you, 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 you know, got published or sold? Or do you remember that? Sure. Oh, how could I forget? It was a book. It wasn't even a story. I had written for <laughs> school newspapers a bit. But I had never so much as sold an, a magazine article before I signed to do my first book, which is called Intimate Nights, the Golden Age of New York Cabaret. Mm -hmm. That was born, that, that idea was, was born of, of those trips to the Yonkers Public Library, looking in old magazines like The New Yorker and becoming... Uh, entranced with the idea of sophisticated New York nightlife and a real smart set of people who were in the know and special. I wanted to be one of them. And that book was published in 1991, September of 1991. And up until that time, I had not had so much as a real article published except for school newspapers. Imagine that, huh? When I started doing that book, I had no cred. I had no um, track record. I had no agent. I had no deal. But I had a lot of desire. You did. And it worked for you. You're working it. You know, I think what's that? The man of letters, I can't think of his name right now, but his quote is style is the uh, style is the clothing of thought. And I imagine you, James, in the library and your imagination just running away with you. And, and that to start that first book, huh? Style of New York nightlife. Well, when I um, was in college at Fordham University in the Bronx, for a couple of years, I worked at the flagship Barnes & Noble on 18th Street and 5th Avenue. And um, part-time job. 
and I was surrounded by books, which has always made me very happy. If you saw this apartment, or it, this is walls of books and recordings, and this is my sweet spot. Uh, there were two books there that I remember uh, noticing and picking up on, and th these books are precious to me to this day. <clears throat> Truman Capote's last published work in his lifetime was a slipcase edition of a story that he wrote called One Christmas. Not to be confused with A Christmas Memory, which had come out in the 60s. One Christmas was a story of a childhood story of how his estranged father, well, he, he lived apart from both of his parents who were divorced, but his father had plucked him out of the, the safe bosom of his southern family and brought him to new orleans to spend a christmas and the story is about what happened next and every christmas i read this and it still brings a tear to my eye it is a perfect story a perfect piece of writing uh, with the simplicity and directness of a children's story mm. and so i learned more from that story than i've probably learned from anything else i've ever read one exception i'll mention afterwards and then there was a book called the paris it was a it was a reissue of the paris and new york diaries of ned rora who later became a close friend of mine oh cool and that book it was just everything i wanted out of life it was an intellect who surrounded himself with towering figures of the classical music world, of the literary world, and who was accepted by those people. It was a great fantasy of mine. Um, and who analyzed and drank in everything that was around him and who had strong, founded opinions on all of it. And this represented the kind of person that I dreamed of being. Mm. I I grew up in a household where my mom, who is alive to this day, is um, good for her. Was so, yeah, indeed. She's in her nineties. She's wow. a she was a housewife and quite contented to be one. And my father repaired cars and trucks for the New York Telephone Company, so he was a blue collar guy, a grease monkey. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, never read a book in his entire life. And so. And, and we never went on a family vacation, for example. So all of this was the reverse blueprint for what I wanted out of my life. I wanted everything that I, hadn't ha I had not had growing up. And by God, I got it. Yeah, you did. <laughs> you lived it. And it started with your face in a book, right? And many books. Let's talk about a couple of those books. Um, Stormy Weather, Lena Horne. Wow, huh? You uh, interviewed hundreds of people for this book you, you've mentioned before, and you actually interviewed her, didn't you? Yes. In um, the spring of 1994, Lena Horne was on the verge of what would be her final comeback. Mm. She had been out of sight for a few years, but had been persuaded to record a new album, which Blue Note Records released um in tribute to although not all of the songs are by billy strayhorn but billy strayhorn duke ellington's alter ego was her best friend and he had died in the in the 60s prematurely and lena loved him and felt safe with him as she did with nobody else and so this was ample cause for her to accept this offer and make a new album <clears throat> And Lena Horne had been another idol and great fascination of mine. And again, I the the, the famous Lena Horne album of the 1950s, which I of course had, was called Lena Horne at the Waldorf Astoria. Uh, and the cover, which has a pink background and a gorgeous Vogue style photo of her from that period is a is a rather frosty album it's a it's a brittle album it has a brittle sophistication about it and other recordings that i heard of lena 
took me underneath that shell. And again, I sensed a lot of pain, a lot of conflict in this woman. And these have always been the things that have drawn me to people and to stories. Mm. And so she, I, I, I acquired everything of Lena Horne that I possibly could. Every album, I saw every movie, I read every article that I could. And so I sold the New York Times on letting me do a piece on Lena Horne. And uh, that spring of 1994, I had um, two hours plus alone in a New York hotel room with Lena Horne. I mean, what was that like I, talking that, to your subject? I mean, it must have been incredible for you. Well, going up with her in the elevator to that room was the longest and scariest elevator ride I've ever taken because this was Lena Horn for God's sake and she was an intimidating figure and I was at Lena at that moment was let me see she would it was 76 on the verge of 77 and I was uh doing the math here about 30 and I was about to sit down with her and ask her all these questions and she told me that day, I don't talk to a lot of people these days. So when I'm with someone like you, I talk too much. And what she meant by that was she had all, she also told me, I knew I was going to be doing this today, but I didn't know you knew so much about me. Uh. And so in my humble opinion, it's the best interview she ever gave. And I have read a lot of them. Good for you. So I crafted that into a newspaper article of 1,200 words, which is nothing, talking about Lena Horn, the, the enormity of this epic story. It called out for a book. I didn't work on it for quite some years, though. In fact, about a decade, a decade passed. I was, uh, when I wrote that article, I was... Um, newly signed no i wasn't i was not a few months away from signing to do a biography of chet baker which was my second book so i became immersed in that and that ended and then there were a couple of years in which i was hopelessly lost and had no idea what to do next and i remembered lena and at that point she was in the news again because there had been in the works a project to create a TV biopic starring Janet Jackson about mm -hmm. Lena Horne. Lena had very mixed feelings about this. <clears throat> she avoided signing her contract. She was holding off and holding off. And then Janet Jackson had her Super Bowl scandal, and this gave Lena her out. Uh. And so the deal was off. What this incident taught me is that people still cared about Lena Horn. This got a lot of attention. And at that point, I decided to set out and do this book. And um, I did, in fact, interview 300 people for that book. And when I was doing it, good Lord, this was almost, could this possibly be, this was 20, oh, let's see, I'm do, again doing the math. I signed to do the book in 2005. So um, 18 years ago, Lordy, every, uh, so many people were still alive who had been right. close to her, including Cotton Club girls, people who had known her in the early 30s were still around to talk to. Most of the MGM people were still around to talk to. Must have been so I did the book you. at the right time. And it came out in 2009 and the paperback came out in 2010 and I was in Palm Springs doing publicity for the paperback and um she died while i was there in oh. fact um i was a little brief sidebar of a story i was friendly with Kay ballard and Kay ballard was in lived in rancho mirage but she was in palm springs doing an event to launch the audiobook version of her paperback and that day in the venue I met, which was a bar, a Polynesian-themed bar, <clears throat> I met Mary Wilson of the Supremes. She was in town. Company. And Good that, company, James. 
<laughs> well, at that time, I was whipping up a promotional device for my Lena Horn book. I had created a show that I would narrate and host, and a singer would sing the songs of Lena Horn. <clears throat> and meeting Mary Wilson that day gave me the idea of asking her if she would be the singer. And it happened. It worked. And on and off for seven years, I traveled with Mary Wilson doing that show. Wow. One of the great experiences of my life. The day after I met Mary Wilson, well, th that day she said she had known Lena Horne. And Lena Horne had been very loving and supportive of the Supremes. And Mary said, I've been trying to reach her. I want to talk to her, but I don't know how. And I said, Mary, I think it's a little too late. And in fact, the next day, Lena Horne died. Wow. So one of Lena's many gifts to me was Mary Wilson. Mm, I bet. Yes, of course. Um, now, she became more of a recluse, didn't she, later in life? Did she not, Lena Horne? The last public performance she gave was in 2000, and she died in 2010. And in those last 10 years, she was barely seen in public. Mm, yeah. Lena, like Marlena Dietrich, knew when to withdraw. Walk away. Not all of them do. Right. Peggy Lee didn't know. A lot of them, Frank Sinatra, a lot of them are are just too hungry for the public. The public is their greatest love affair. Not easily switched off. Um, Lena, in her last uh, decade or so around, not only did full, not only did she fully evoke the everything we loved about Lena Horne. Not only was she the most gorgeous, glamorous older lady you could hope to see. She still had it. And therefore, when Lena withdrew, she left us with nothing but memories of her beauty and her greatness. Uh -huh. Watching our idols deteriorate before our eyes can be depressing. It can. When you see someone that you've grown up adoring falling apart in front of your eyes, it's, it, there's something chilling about it because you identify with that. Mm -hmm. And Lena would not allow that. Yeah. Marlena didn't allow that. Right. That's yeah, great. I mean, look at the people that were inspired by her. I mean, Barbara Streisand, Aretha Franklin, Eartha Kitten. It just goes on and on and on. Stormy Lena. Lena. Well, when Lena uh, lurched on the scene in a big way, when well, well, when she when Hollywood discovered Lena Horne, which was 1942, Lena was slightly known up until that point as a band singer a little tiny bit uh, in cotton club circles because she had had um, a few, a couple of little nice solo moments at the cotton club, but otherwise Lena was not famous and MGM discovered her because of Walter White who ran the NAACP and Walter White was looking for a beautiful young black woman who could perhaps revolutionize the way Hollywood and America, the American viewing public thought of black people. Mm. And he spotted that potential in Lena Horn. And so from the very beginning, Lena Horn had a mantle to wear. She had, she had a task. She was not signed like the other girls were signed at MGM because they were fabulous. She wasn't Ann Miller. She wasn't June Allison. She wasn't Esther Williams. She wasn't signed because she tap danced great or swam great or was the girl next door. She was uh, brought aboard because there was a task to be done. And for the next many years to come, Lena had that mantle to wear. She had a heavy responsibility to be impeccable. Mm -hmm. to be a model black performer, a model black person. And she accomplished this task extraordinarily well, but there was a price to pay because she couldn't simply live her life. She was always being watched. She was always being scrutinized. There was always judgment around her and she had to live up to it. And she did. Yeah, she did. 
Yeah. Also mysterious in a way, I remember. See, and the other lady I want to talk about right now is Peggy Lee, the other book you did, because both of these ladies, I remember they're guesting on, you know, variety shows back in the day on TV. They were both, I mean, talk about charisma with uh, with our, you know, Lena Horn. I mean, charismatic lady, but something mysterious about mysterious about her as well as Peggy Lee. Although Peggy Lee, you know, seven decade career, um, who once said, I think she said, music is like my breath or my breathing or something like that. She had a sadness about her. I thought something about that. Right? You're talking about Lena or Peggy? Ah, uh, Peggy Lee, because they both did. I know, right? when Peggy touched your heart when she sang a song about shattered love or about love passing her by as she did for a very interesting late 60s early 70s period of her career when she was singing a lot about the sense that it was all over for her that's how she felt these women were not these women had acting skills, but that's not what they were singing out of. They had the craft of acting, but at the heart of it were real feelings. And Lena Horn, I remember so well, after Ella Fitzgerald died, there was a two-part tribute to her at Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. And Lena didn't perform, but she came out and spoke to the host, Jonathan Schwartz. Mm -hmm. And she said of Ella, she described Ella as a golden typewriter. And that meant that when Ella sang a song, she sang the song in pristine form, uh. Uh, regardless of how she improvised on it. The song, the performance was not colored with Ella's Michigas. And when Lena sang, she and Peggy, too, they carried all their baggage with them on stage, which I personally prefer. Right. And so sadness, God, yes, uh, in the latish 60s i guess around 1966 67 lena was on the bell telephone hour and she sang moon river great song. sweet sentimental song yeah. lena brought so much personal sadness to that song that you you re it, it it made seeing it for the first time moved me very deeply because you could see what an unhappy lady this was underneath all of the glamour. Mm. This is always what I connect with. I don't think I could write a book about somebody like Fred Astaire because he was too normal and well-adjusted. There's There are volumes to be written and have been written about Fred Astaire's artistry and his significance in the age that he, that he appeared. But I, because of the nature of my childhood and the fact that i grew up with a father who drank which really made the first 16 years of my life very difficult um what gets me going as a writer is a sense of that a sense of something um hidden and dark that people are transforming into this beautiful moving art right without that i'm I can do a professional job, but I can't really do a passionate job. Well, you do a passionate job and you do it well. Um, <laughs> what surprised you about the research with Peggy Lee? Anything surprised you in your research with her? Hmm. Well, the Peggy Lee book, the roots of that were a, a Vanity Fair article. I've gotten one chance to do a feature for Vanity Fair. And uh, it came, I was signed to do it in 1999 shortly after Peggy had had a whopping stroke and was not expected to live for long. But Peggy Lee had, being a North Dakota girl who had survived prairie life at its toughest back in the 1920s and 30s, yeah, depression. these people were strong. That's why that a lot of the women lived forever. That's why when I was researching that book, I was able again to find people who had known Peggy Lee in the late 1920s. Imagine that. Wow. One of my great sources for the book was a wonderful woman named Artis, Artis Konitz. And Artis Konitz was Peggy's best friend in the little town of, um, in a little um, 
Nortonville, North Dakota, a tiny little town from the, and and they were friends from 1928 to 1934. When when and Peggy Lee was from, really Norma Ekstrom or whatever her real name was. Yes, she which, was. Which, which the indeed. radio guy, I think, in North Dakota changed her name to Peggy Lee, didn't it? Wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Ken Kennedy, who was a disc jockey in Fargo, North Dakota. What a radio name, Ken Kennedy. <laughs> Ken Kennedy. I, I wonder if that was even his real name, but he gave her the name Peggy Lee. Peggy Lee was a great stage name. Peggy Lee has a, it's like a, a little, um, it's like percussion. It has a little rhythm to it. It's snappy yeah, and short. Good. Yeah. Norma Dolores Ekstrom was to corn poem. But in any case, what uh, what surprised me, first of all, the the fact that Peggy Lee had lived in a self-created dream world. If you read Peggy Lee's memoirs, which I don't recommend because they're silly, it's a silly book, uh, it's a silly, deluded book, <clears throat> you will read, you will enter Peggy's dreamland. It's not uninteresting. It's just not honest. To me, the truth is always more interesting than the made-up stuff. Mm. And everything, all of our issues in life, is it's all determined in, in, in our relationship with our parents and the circumstances of our growing up. And because of artists and because of, um, of another dear friend of mine who had gone to North Dakota and extensively researched Peggy in the newspapers, the local newspapers in all the towns where she had lived. And he handed over all that research to me. Um, in Jamestown, North Dakota, if it's 1928, there ain't a hell of a lot going on. <laughs> and everything gets written about in the newspaper. If so-and-so puts on their Sunday best and gets on a train to Fargo to go shopping, chances are that would end up in the newspaper. And so there were mentions of artists and of Norma in the newspaper and quite a bit about her father who worked on the railroad and about her allegedly vicious stepmother, Min, mm. uh, who, whom Peggy villainized to a comic book degree in later years. She hated Min and Min hated her and Peggy made Min out to be an abusive a uh, violent ogre, which was not quite the case, as Artis was able to explain to me, because she was there. She yeah. saw this stuff with her own eyes. She was in the house. And so if you're a biographer and you find somebody like that, it's your lucky day. Magic. Yeah. So she went, I think she had 13 Grammy nominations, Peggy Lee. She had a a Lifetime Achievement Award, I think, in 1995, and I think she won a Grammy. Um, so she had a great career, seven decades of it anyway, right? Um, and, of course, the songs you think about, there's many of hers, but the song Fever and the other tune I think about is, is that all there is? I just hear her singing that. Uh, well, thank you for today, uh, James. Thanks for your time today. I was going to ask you, what's next for James Gavin? Because I know your latest book, George Michael, A Life, has been out for a while now. So what's on the what's on the books for you now, James? I was invited to do what I call a between books book in that in that this book is shorter than the the normal weighty tomes that I do. Right. But um a British publisher has asked me to do a biography of someone I knew. Oh. Uh Anita O'Day, one of the great stories in jazz, one of the greatest stories I've ever told. And again, I have the advantage of having spent a lot of time with Anita. I interviewed her in depth for the New York Times. And it is just a fabulous, wacky hell ride of a story, a great one of the great jazz stories ever. And so I'm loving doing that book. This book for me rally. is just a lark. It's a it's a piece of cake. And I'm doing that now and it's due at the end of the year. And uh, and I'm quite excited about that book. It won't get the it probably won't get the play that some of my other books have gotten. But in a way, I hope it does, because Anita O'Day, man, talk about like these other people I've I've written about. She created something that had never happened before, including a whole persona mm. that was comparable to nothing and no one. And uh how many people do that? Right. So, so anyway, Anita deserves 
a, a, a good book and I am doing my damnedest to give her one. Her well, memoirs are wonderful, but, but yeah. they cut off in 1980 and a lot of stuff happened after that. But well, we look forward to it and it's right up your alley. So we're looking forward to the Need Day book. And James, Thank you so much, Ken. Thank what you, a James. pleasure to talk to you. It's absolutely a pleasure for me too. Thank you, my friend, for your time. Keep smiling, James. Trying. <laughs> Bye, Ken.